Okay, welcome to the third and last part of chapter two. We're going to be looking at pH and buffers, carbon a little bit more closely, as well as a few functional groups. So a pH of a solution tells you if it's acidic or basic, also known as alkaline. And any body of water, some of the water molecules will dissociate or ionize into an equal number of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. So here in this reaction, we start with water, liquid, liquid water, and some of it will ionize into these hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, in which we put aqueous here because now these ions are in a body of water. In pure water, the concentration of hydrogen ions is 1 times 10 to the negative 7 moles, moles per liter. And then uh, the same thing is true for the hydroxide ions. If you have a high proton concentration in a solution, it's acidic. If you have a low proton concentration or high hydroxide ion concentration, the solution is basic or alkaline. In one of our future labs, we're going to be working with pH, acids, and bases in much more detail. If I wanted to calculate pH given the proton concentration of a solution, I could do so using this equation. Um, so neutral solutions have a pH of 7. Acidic solutions will be less than 7. And basic solutions will have a pH greater than 7. Do you happen to know, what do you think the pH of our blood, of human blood, is? So water is neutral, 7. The average pH of blood is about 7.4. And there's a very narrow range of acceptable blood pH values. It goes from about 7.35 to 7.45. Any lower or higher than this can be deadly. But if I think about it, if I drink like a can of Coca-Cola, like a soda, those are pretty acidic, like down here. So what happens when I drink a can of Coke? How come I don't die, right? My pH, the pH of my blood stays relatively stable. I wonder why that is. What do you guys think? This example might give us a clue, and it's kind of closely related. So let's say I have a beaker of water here on my left and a beaker of milk on my right. And the pH of each solution is about 7, pretty close to neutral. Then I drop one drop of strong acid, hydrochloric acid, into each. If then I test the pH after this, what do you think the pH will change to? This one on the left, the pH might be around 2 after adding strong acid. But the one on the right may be close to maybe about 6-ish. So the one that had a much greater change in pH is the water and the milk didn't change as much. Why is this? So the answer are buffers. Buffers play an important role in helping us maintain consistent pH. And in the human body, one of the most important buffers of the blood is something called bicarbonate. And if you stay and study physiology in the future, you're going to see this equation a lot when you're dealing with acid-base physiology, learning about the lungs and the kidneys and how they maintain normal blood pH. We're also gonna see this in one of our future labs as well. All right, our next topic is carbon. Remember carbon was one of those four most common elements, chon, in living organisms. We're also going to see it a lot in the next chapter when we talk about the large molecules. Carbon's unique because it can form covalent bonds with up to four different atoms. And a lot of the times, especially when we're dealing with these four macromolecules, we're gonna see carbon bonded to at least three hydrogens. The last one might be another carbon, it could be hydrogen. We'll see carbons in long chains in the future. This allows carbon to serve as a backbone for many of these macromolecules. Hydrocarbons are formed when carbon and hydrogen are bonded together, for example, in methane. And covalent bonds are what connect them. It takes a lot of energy to form covalent bonds. So when we break the covalent bonds, energy is released to do work. One example 
is in our body, and we're going to see this a lot later when we look at uh, metabolism, is when we eat bread or other foods, we have glucose and we store glucose in our body. When we need energy, we break down the carbon and hydrogen or carbon-carbon bonds in glucose, and we form CO2. This gives us a lot of energy and RG to power uh, the reactions that we need. The same reaction happens when we light a match. When you light a match, you actually are breaking down carbohydrates and releasing CO2, and you see a burst of you know, flames. But the difference is in our bodies, we break down the bonds very slowly, and when you light a match, you basically release all of that energy all at once, um, over here really, and that creates the fire that you see. Our book gives us three examples of hydrocarbons in this picture. So we have methane, here we see in methane and ethane, there are single bonds forming between carbon and hydrogen. And we can even have double bonds formed. One of the major differences is that when single bonds are formed, rotation is possible around the bond. But in double bonds, uh, there is no rotation allowed between the carbons connected by the double bond. Aliphatic hydrocarbons are the ones we just saw earlier and consist of linear chains of carbon atoms, and sometimes they can even form rings, all with single bonds. So this one is all single bonds. This one's also single bonds, cyclopentane and cyclohexane. Another type are aromatic hydrocarbons, and those are shown on the right. These are closed rings of carbon atoms, and they have alternating double and single bonds. All right, here we have isomers. Isomers are molecules that have the same chemical formula, but they're different because the atoms are placed differently or arranged differently. So on the top, for example, we have structural isomers. Butane, butane is C4H10, and that's true for the left picture and on the right as well. But this one, you can see there's a different covalent arrangement of atoms. Here we have a linear chain. Here, I can see carbon is branched off over here. In the second type of isomer, we're looking at geometric isomers and how carbon atoms, um, or how they have a different arrangement of atoms or functional groups around a double bond. Remember double bonds? You cannot rotate across a double bond. So if I look at the one on the left, the methyl groups are on the same side of the methyl bond, creating a cis arrangement. On the right, they're on the opposite sides, creating a trans arrangement. And this is going to become important when we're looking at fats or lipids. Um, certain lipids or fats are easier for us to break down and don't cause as many health problems, but others are harder to break down because of their specific arrangement they tend to accumulate in our blood vessel walls and cause problems that way. Finally, we have enantiomers. Again, they have the same chemical formula, but they have a different placement of atoms around the central carbon. Here we have mirror images, or molecules that are mirror images of each other, but they are not superimposable. You cannot place one and overlap it with the other. It's a lot like having left and right gloves. You can't put your right hand into your left glove properly. And this is really important in terms of chemical reactivity. One isomer may be reactive or cause a certain reaction, and the other may not, or even cause harmful um, reactions to occur. It's also interesting because they play a role in the pharmaceutical industry as well. So two enantiomers of a drug, those mirror images, might have different effects in the body. Usually, interestingly enough, only one of the isomers is actually biologically active. So this shows us that even really subtle variations can have dramatic effects. So I thought, you don't have to know this, it's not from the book, you don't have to know this for the test, but I thought it's interesting and I thought I'd show you guys that 
um, when drug companies are patenting a drug, um, it's common practice where they introduce a drug as a racemic mixture at first with both an antimers present, the one that's active and the one that doesn't do anything. And then when their patent is about to expire and they don't want it to become public, um, they release a new patent with a new improved version, which is actually just the active enantiomer. And antimers really became important to the pharmaceutical industry um, really after the Softenon disaster. And this is a while ago. Again, this is not in our book. This is just FYI. Um, so what happened was in the 1950s, uh, the company sold a drug called thalidomide, and it was sold as a racemic mixture. So both enantiomers were found in the drug. And they used different names uh, to sell this product, Contragen and Softenon. And the idea behind it was that one of the enantiomers would decrease morning sickness for people who had really severe morning sickness. But it, they later found out in the 1960s that only the R enantiomer had the right, the correct pharmaceutical effect. And actually the other enantiomer, the S enantiomer, was actually very harmful and led to serious issues like miscarriages. So earlier we saw geometric isomers due to the arrangement of atoms or functional groups across a double bond. You can have two that are on the same side or on the opposite side of the double bond trans. This changes the shape of certain molecules. So when we have long hydrocarbon chains, such as the ones shown here and here, where carbon is represented by the black spheres and hydrogen is represented by the white spheres. When you have cis or trans arrangements, this causes different shapes. So trans configurations, like the one on the right, the carbons are on the opposite sides of the bond. And if you have a bunch of them in a chain, these fats tend to form a linear shape overall. Saturated fats look similar to trans fats, and saturated fats are fats or hydrocarbon chains that have no double bonds. These are all single bonds in the chain portion. In contrast, if you have hydrocarbon chains with double bonds in the cis configuration, wherever you see a double bond, you will see a kink or a bending in that fatty acid, uh, fatty acid structure. So when this happens, it actually makes the fats easier to break down. And this is typically what most unsaturated fats will look like. They're bent. These lipids, because they're bent, they don't pack very tightly. They're easier to break down. Whereas trans fats or saturated fats that look more like this tend to be linear. They tend to pack tightly. They're harder to break down. They tend to cause more problems in terms of health. Our last topic, which we'll just cover briefly, are functional groups. Functional groups are groups of atoms within a molecule that confer very consistent and very specific properties to the molecules that contain them or are comprised of them. Each of the four types of macromolecules we're going to see in the next chapter, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and uh, nucleic acids like DNA and RNA have characteristic functional groups that give them their properties. They're also often going to interact with one another through hydrogen bonds, and we'll see that in the next slide. So these are the functional groups that I would like you to know. Okay, so please be familiar with these functional groups. You're going to see them over and over again in our course. For each, you should be able to uh, name the functional group if you see them. You should be able to draw the functional group and tell me the basic properties shown in this table. So for example, this is the hydroxyl functional group. It's polar, and I remember, oh, polar means it's water-loving, hydrophilic. Methyl, I can see that it's nonpolar. I have a carbonyl group, carboxyl, etc. We'll go over them. You'll see them again and again in chapter three and in the future chapters.
one almost sneak peek of how functional groups appear in one of these large molecules, these macromolecules. Here I have a picture or a part of DNA, one of the nucleic acid types. And I can see, I know that DNA is in a helix structure, a double helix structure. And there are two strands that form like a twisted ladder. I see a bunch of those functional groups. I see like a phosphate group. I see a carbonyl. I see the amino group. And I can see that there are hydrogen bonds between the two strands of DNA. And the hydrogen bonds are being formed between the functional groups. Okay, and this takes us to the end of chapter two. I'll see you when we start chapter three, which covers the large biological molecules, also known as macromolecules. Thank you.